So this is uh, in Galatians chapter 5. It's where we're talking about the gifts of the Spirit and the flesh and the Spirit, how they are at odds with each other. It says, for the flesh craves anything that opposes the Spirit. All right? Man, that's a rough one. And the Spirit craves whatever opposes the flesh. And they both are contrary to one another, lest you would be doing whatever you want. And, and that's, the, that's the tagline of the world. I could do whatever I want. It's my body. And I could do whatever I want with it. You can't tell me what to do with it. You can't put your value system on top of me. Well, no, maybe we can't force anything, but we could sure recommend God's way of doing things has been proven for thousands of years. And it's a little arrogant to think that you're going to throw away the wisdom of the ages and come up with your own system that's better than God's way to do it. And those of us that are Christians probably just were humbled enough and recognized the flaws of that way of thinking. And in my mind, I got exposed to this spiritual principle that there's war going on between my flesh and my spirit. And then I understood it so much more easily why I was so tempted to sin. You know, just as I was coming into the, to my understanding of the Lord, I was living a very decadent lifestyle. And this, this really helped me. It uncovered the underlying spiritual law behind it, is that our flesh and our spirit are at odds with each other. There's a war. So Proverbs 25, 28 says, a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. I, I don't want you to think that this is a works mentality. I already started by saying, right, we're saved by grace, thief on the cross, there was nothing he could do to earn his salvation. There's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. It's by grace. Otherwise, we would be bragging about it, right? Because that's our human nature trying to kick in. But I, I heard one man say it this way. God is not opposed to effort. He's opposed to earning. <laughs> so to think that we can get him to love us more if we do more. He doesn't love you anymore. He's, he already loves you more than you can even realize. The doing helps us live out the walk. And if you think of AA, right, you know, the, a lot of you probably know the 12 steps. And the 12th step is to go find somebody else that needs help and help them. And why is that so powerful? Because you keep being reminded what it was like to be in that early stage and how hard it is. And for us, that's like witnessing to people, right? You don't want to be so far away from the lost that you forget what it's like to be in that position because then your heart can get religious and you can turn judgmental against him. And, and the Lord wants us to keep a soft heart. So my condition was that I was like that city with the walls broken down. The temptations and the addictions were breaking my immune system. And I, I, I reached a point when I got saved and said, you know what, I'm never having another drink. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to wrestle with this thing and, and see if I can be a social drinker or not. Like I already, from the ages of 15 to 25, I hit the quota for my whole life in 10 years. I don't need another drink. So you don't, you may not take that position. Trisha doesn't take that position. So I'll have a glass of wine when we go out. It's not a sin. What is a sin is to be drunk. And I knew for me personally, if I didn't have the first one, I'd never have to worry about that one again. And I don't miss it. I haven't missed it at all. Still have plenty of fun when I go out with friends. I didn't think you could do that. So where there's fruit, there's a root. That's up at the top. That, that's really important tied in with this idea that God gives us power to have control. It's not self-control. It's the control. It's the fruit of the Spirit right here. Galatians 22, uh, 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience or forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and please say the last one with me, self-control. The Holy Spirit gives us that ability. That's not our natural ability because we're very given and uh, given to temptations. And that's that war between our flesh and our spirit, man. The, the flesh doesn't want to have any of its appetites throttled. And, and the Holy Spirit's saying there's a better way to live than that. Why is fasting so good? Because you're reminding your flesh you're not in charge. Spirit man's in charge. And I'm not going to allow my appetites to control me because the Lord has a higher level of living than that. And I like this one too. <laughs> it's 
took me a while to get this when I first got saved. It says in Matthew 7, 17 and 18, people and their lives are like trees. Good trees bear beautiful, tasty fruit, but bad trees bear ugly, bitter fruit. A good tree cannot bear ugly, bitter fruit, nor can a bad tree bear fruit that is beautiful and tasty. Now, here's the thing I didn't realize. We're all bearing fruit, right? It's good or bad, you're, you're, you're not getting by without bearing something. And typically, you know, there's more good than bad, but if you see some bad fruit coming out, and you can think of a bad temper, certainly could be one that's easy enough driving around here. Certainly see enough people with, uh, with bad tempers. Well, maybe as you get closer to New York, out here it's not as bad. But like, wow, is that a fruit of the spirit? Rage. <laughs> that wasn't listed. But did I get caught up in road rage? Yeah, I inherited that one from my dad. The gift that keeps on giving, right? Yeah, wow, is right. I saw so many times when I was growing up where he just exploded. And even though I didn't want to do it, it got a seed got planted in there, and, and that happened to me. I had to be delivered from that. So look, you know, this is really important that you're bearing fruit right now, period. Every one of us, every day, we're bearing fruit. And and if we're if we're willing to be honest with the Lord, just say, show me the good fruit from the bad, and help me get to the root, because once the root gets cleansed, it can't produce bad fruit anymore. Amazing, isn't it, how that works? So this isn't something to be like, oh, no, for the rest of my Christian walk, I'm going to have to be looking at, at you know, I'm going to have to be a fruit inspector. <laughs> no, it's because we want to please him, right? And, and pleasing him is being the most effective we can be, and the more we can unveil the enemy's tactics and get to the truth in our lives, the better. That's my, my way of looking at it. Um, this is important, I think, for people that are going to be in ministry because, again, it's like a boiling down of a lot of things we've learned over the years. But Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, this is uh, 12, 11 and 12. He himself, the Lord, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Okay? Teachers. For what? The equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Okay? That's only five. I know there's many more listed, but this is a pretty nice symbolic way of thinking about ministry that there's whatever there is, 40, 35 people in this room right now. Not one of us has the exact same gift mix as others. But if we looked at trends and tendencies and, and what a dominant gift might be versus what a less dominant gift might be, we can come up with kind of a, a package, a gift mix, I would say. And you know how this goes. Who do you want as a greeter in your church? Somebody who's very shy and introverted? No, you want my sister-in-law, Linda. You know, she's always smiling. She's always happy. You're like, Linda, good talking to you, but I got to get in the service here. She just loves seeing you, right? Like, she's also an evangelist. She'll talk to anybody about the Lord. And it's been amazing fruit that's been on her. But not everybody's meant to be a greeter because your personality's just not, and there's nothing to be ashamed about that, right? So we just want to be who God made us to be and not try to be jealous and project somebody else's gift like, oh my God, I'm not Heidi Baker, I'm not in Africa, I'm not a good Christian. Well, that was her calling. Now, it's only bad if that was your calling and you ran away, like, you know, you get swallowed by a whale when that happens. <laughs> So you don't want to do that, but you want to be surrounded by mature Christians who can help you say, hey, this is what I see when I look at you, man. There's just so much fruit. You just light up when you get in this thing, whatever that thing is. And then we help each other, and we grow. And boy, this is so powerful. So the, the picture that I always like to, to show this actually comes from the Navigators ministry. A man named Dawson Trotman founded the ministry called Navigators, which is uh, college campus ministry. He was friends with Billy Graham, so it goes way back uh, into the 40s and 50s. And he was an evangelist by his uh, dominant gift was evangelist. And he would win these sailors in San Diego. He was based in San Diego, and they were going out to World War II. So, you know, by design, he was talking to people who were very much in touch with their own mortality who could be dying soon on that ship. And he would get them saved, and he would say, look, when you're out on that ship, there's, there's some key things you have to remember. And he would draw a ship's wheel, navigator, ship's wheel, navy, right? Made sense. 
the Lord showed him what to do. He said, you're going to have to have Christ at the center of everything you do. You're going to have to find a, a fellowship, which, which would be the pastoral side. You see the, the spokes on the wheel. The fellowship goes one way, and then the uh, uh, outreach kind of, you know, let other people know. Be witnessing to other people. You've got to study the Word of God, and you've got to pray. And those four things have to be encompassed by obedience to God. You may not understand everything you're saying, uh, reading in the Bible, but you want to obey it and ask other people that you come in fellowship with to help you understand what you're having a hard time understanding. And at the center of that is Christ. And if we wanted to overlay Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, I think it overlays pretty easily. Because you could say Christ is the center, he's the apostle, right? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. The apostle is what you'd say the apostle Paul in the New Testament as well. What did he do? He went to a new region. He got people saved. He raised up elders, planted a church, and left and went to the next one. So he wasn't doing so much as planting, overseeing, and building, and keep on building. That's a very different role than the pastor of that church. The pastor is very good at staying with the sheep and growing up the sheep and teaching them and caring for them. The evangelist is very different than the pastor. The evangelist doesn't want to grow up the sheep. He wants to go find the next hurting person. They're, those are two very different gift mixes. They're not right or wrong. We need them both. And then there's the prayer piece that's, uh, that's this way to God. We're not just speaking to him. We're also hearing from him. And that's why I put the prophet on the top there because that's the closest one and worship and the prophetic and intercession is very much in line with that prophetic gift and then the teaching at the bottom is that foundation of the word and and the way he would say it is you in order to be a, a healthy whole christian you need to have all five of these areas functioning in your life all right you want to be in fellowship you want to be sharing your faith you got to be studying the word you got to be praying and then there's that ceo role in your life to make sure that's all in balance. And what could happen with a church is that we can get tilted off in one or, or, or more of these directions, and then we, we could become out of balance as well. If there's no new Christians coming in, if there's no teaching the Christians that are there, if there's so much prophetic that there's no grounding in the word, or there's so much word that, that the prophetic never is allowed, right? that's not good for anybody. So the leadership is, is meant to keep the whole thing in balance and moving forward and not get too far out of line, A, and B, not to become a clone of who's ever in the pulpit leading, right? And that's really difficult. I'm, I'm saying this for a reason tonight because most of us really get drawn to people who are like us. <laughs> and we have a hard time with people who have a different gift mix seeing that as a gift. <laughs> so... Prophetic people and spreadsheets don't always go hand in hand. <laughs> spreadsheets and prophetic worship don't always go hand in hand. Jazz music would be much more like the prophetic, right? But sheet music, classical music, that is that grounding in the word. So you could see, hear a verse that says, let all things be done decently and in order, right? And the pastor, the word guy's going, let all things be done decently. And the prophetic person saying, let all things be done. <laughs> Same verse. Two different ways of looking at it, right? 